um, there was three women who were poisoned. Um, <clears throat> he wanted to discuss uh, the situation, the antecedents of uh, George Chapman, and that was Kozowski's uh, um, made-up name later on. And here's what he said. This is about the, uh, the Pynchon Street torso. Quote, a woman came to England from either Russia or Poland and claimed him as her husband. Her arrival, however, was at a most inopportune time for Klosowski, he continues. He had already gone through a marriage ceremony with another woman. Two women met at his house. Both claimed the distinction of being the real wife, and neither would give way to the other. For some time, the two women actually lived in the same building, close quote. That's Hargrave Adams. Now, it didn't take long for a solution to be arrived at, and here's what Adams said later on. He said, quote, at length, one of the women went away, disappeared, and he made it emphasized, disappeared, leaving the other mistress of the situation. The one who remained was the more recently wedded one, a Polish woman whose maiden name was Lucy Bagersky. Now, this disappearing act occurred in late 1889. Now, as I mentioned, on November 10th, 1889, a torso was discovered under the railroad arch at Pritchard Street across from Kozowski's new residence and business. The dump site was only a few blocks south of where, where Ripper victim Elizabeth Stride was murdered the previous year on Burner Street. So it's right near a Ripper victim. It's right near where he's uh, living within easy distance. Once again, we've got a body dropped practically on Kozowski's doorstep. And again, there's no other suspect that's ever been that close to another Ripper victim. So we've got two. We've got a torso victim. We've got a Ripper victim right on his doorstep. Now, the body was dumped between police patrols. So the killer was observing the patrols. The killer had to come from the south because the Pynchon Street was closed off by wooden paling from the north. So no one from the north could have accessed those areas where the body was dumped. So with an easy distance, he would have seen it. No head was ever located. No legs. But there was a 15-inch gash on the abdomen. This is Ripper style. Now there's an interesting home office report. And it comes to us like this. Quote, the body then must have been concealed where the murder was committed. He's living in a home very close. Right? Continues. This lead. This leads to the inference that it was connected and concealed in some place to which the murderer had access over which he had control and from which he was averse to move the corpse. We may say that the murder was committed probably in the house or lodging of the murderer and that he conveyed the portion found to Pynchon Street to get rid of it. Now it's interesting. Close quote. Now it's interesting to note that the body had been beaten before death. That's the first time we've ever seen that. So this guy obviously knew this woman. For some reason, was angry at her, and he actually washed the body after it was killed, which is kind of strange as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's a bit bizarre. Now the coroner's verdict was also very curious. The coroner verdict was willful murder against some persons unknown. So they're acknowledging that at least two people were involved in this murder and deposition of the oh, body. Wow. Okay. And that's the first time we've ever seen that. Yep. Okay. Not even in the Ripper murder do we have that. And that no other torso murder either. Now my question is, did he have help on this one? And was it his new wife? Because remember they were living together, both wives. Now, again, we have the uh, uh, Adam saying this woman disappeared. There's no trace of her after that. So wife comes over. She disappears. Torso shows up. Mm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is perhaps critical murder in the series of both the torso murders and ripper murders because the evidence is still somewhat available, which is kind of rare for this, this series 120 some odd years ago. With a prime suspect could possibly be linked to one individual. The torso was placed in a specially constructed metal container preserved in alcohol and welded shut. That still exists. The remains were buried in the grave, number 16185 East London Cemetery, Grand Street. Now, there's a plaque on it, and the plaque reads, This case contains the body of a woman, unknown, found in Pynchon Street, St. George's in the East, 10th September, 89. Close quote. Now, if DNA can be extracted from the remains, and I think it can because, obviously, if it's in a sealed container, it's buried, there's no oxygen in there, it's been protected. So, at least from marrow of the bones, you can get DNA. Let me ask you a question real quick, Michael. Yes, sir. Um, is there any statute, a limitation on murder? Nope. Okay, so England is like America. 
Yep. Okay. It's an open case. Open case. It's an open okay. case. Now, obviously, we're not going to uh, convict anybody and hang them, but we can still find uh, the killer if we, we do enough research yet. Now, if this can be a link to the original wife of Kozowski, we can not only close the file on the five torso murders, but we can probably close the file on Jack the Ripper. So as we discussed earlier, there's only one last possible Ripper murder in London, that of Francis Cole of 1891. So it's about the time for him to move up to a safer date. But like I said, this is a critical uh, murder victim because, like I said, the evidence is probably about as fresh as it was 100 and some odd years ago. Okay. And if you could actually find the name of his wife, his real wife, I guess the first Polish wife that he left uh, in 1887, then you've tied him to a body that went right across the street. So that's kind of interesting. Let me ask you another question. Um, yes. Something that you said earlier. Um, so you actually found a torso in the uh, where in Scotland Yard? Scotland Yard's new headquarters, yes. Okay, so that was, do you think it was, a, it was vindictive, vindictive and vindictively done? Or do you think it was just a... I mean, sort of, here it is, catch yeah. me if you can kind of a thing? Yeah. Uh, I really don't know, to be honest with you. Um, the only people who could get there, in other words, it was emphasized in the newspaper reports I read, that it was extremely difficult to find that position so deep in the area. So the individual had to have some knowledge of where the body was going to be placed, where the torso and the arm was later found was, was uh, placed. So it's very possible and here's another uh, area of investigation that possibly ever came up. If you've got a list of workers, maybe Kozowski was doing a little work that uh, that season. Very because it had to be somebody who knew the area. Very likely. So uh, uh, catch me if you can. Possibly. That cannot be ruled out. Not at this point. Okay. So let me ask you a question. After the murders ended in London, where did Kozowski go? <clears throat> well, around six weeks after the final murder of Francis Cole, 1891, he was on the way to America. He arrived there on April the 22nd, 1891, on the SS Wyland, W-I-E-L-A-N-D, in the New York Harbor. And once again, a body was about to drop. In your book, The American Murders of Jack the Ripper, you identified four possible victims of Jack the Ripper in the United States. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, that was uh, Carrie Brown, Hannah Robinson, Elizabeth Sr., and Herta Mary Anderson. Now, the first one was murdered and this is uh, rather convenient for the time, and this again gets into space and time. The first one was murdered some 48 hours after Kozowski arrived in New York City, only a few blocks from the docks, and he was right on time. So the Ripper murders have ended, and uh, the torso murders have been suspended, and he's right on time for a murder in New York City. And the first one was uh, Carrie Brown. She had a nickname of Old Shakespeare. Now, she was at least 60 years old. She's one of the oldest victims there. Uh, it was April the 23rd, 24th, 1891. She's a working prostitute. Had been uh, a minor stage presence, I guess. Did some Shakespeare. Okay. Wow. Hence her name. Uh, when she was drunk, she used to uh, sing Shakespeare <laughs> in, in the, the jail. Hence her name. Now, on that evening, Carrie had met a man, the second one of the night. Again, she's a working prostitute. On a local street near the, white, uh, near the waterfront. Again, that's the docking area where the ships come in. On the east side of Manhattan. This is just north of, uh, of the major bridge there. Her customer was described by a fellow prostitute and her friend, Mary Minter. Now, Mary Minter had been with her most of the day. They'd been drinking at several places, bars, and, you know, run-down hotels. Minter replied him, uh, uh, reported that her final customer was, quote, about 35 years old, 5 feet 8, in, eight, five feet eight inches in height, of slim build, with a long, sharp nose and a heavy mustache of light color, he wore an old black derby hat, the crown of which had been much, much dented. That's pretty close to our, our man there. Uh, Carrie went to the East River Hotel near the dock around 11 uh, p.m. with her final customer, and that's about maybe three blocks from the dock from where the ships were coming in. They went upstairs to room number 31, and she was by then quite drunk again, uh, just like some of the other Ripper victims, uh, weak, older, not in good health. That's the way he liked his victims. 9.30 the next morning, she's found in the bed, dead. Uh, clothes are turned up over her head, very close to the way that Martha Cavum looked. Uh, she had been strangled first, again, like the Ripper murders, and she'd been attacked with a knife. And the medical report was, quote, a gas extending from the base of the spine around the abdomen to the front of the body, and she had been disemboweled. Now, what's interesting about this case also 
is that there was a large X carved in the lower back side. Now, if you add up all the Ripper murders, the ones that were before the attack, there are nine of them, potentially. If this was the tenth, that would be more than the tenth. Wow. So, now, was it just a carve because he wanted to do that, or was it signifying this is my tenth kill? Don't know. Now, the question again, once we, again, we observed that Kozowski had been in New York City for about 48 hours before this murder occurred. And it is well noted that the Ripper murders had ended when he left England, and the torso murders had been, shall we say, suspended while he was in America. So the timing of these murders begin to overlap. You're looking at, at uh, geographical location, you're looking at time and space. He arrives in England in time for the torso murders, in time for the Ripper murders. He leaves. Both murders in England stop. There's no more Ripper murders. The torso murders are suspended for for a while, there'll be one more later on. And just as he arrives in New York, another body drops. So again, you can't say he did it, but it's pretty circumstantial. Now there's a second one, and these murders in, in America appear to be going off every three or four months. Next one, as we talked about earlier, was Hannah Robinson. She's 25 years old. She was a suspected part-time prostitute. I can tell you why they did that. This is August the 2nd, 1891, and he's definitely confirmed to be in America at that point. Okay. She had come from England. She worked as a surgeon, uh, servant, but she had a good deal of money. Uh, thus, the thought that uh, the reporters and, and some of the investigators thought she had at least been part-time prostitute. She had a good deal more money than she should have if she was just a servant. Uh, she was always dressed well, as a matter of fact. On her last day, she arrived from Hillet, which was a small New York town she worked in, to Brooklyn to do some shopping. Well, she was found the next morning near Glendale, Long Island, so the killer had to kill her in, in New York Manhattan and drive across the river and she was dumped in Long Island uh, far away from, from where she had been murdered, obviously because there was no blood there. And they found that out. She had been strangled, again, like a ripper victim, but she wasn't mutilated and she had lost a good sum, some of her money. She always carried a good uh, load of money. So in other words, she had more than she should have had, ran into the wrong person. Was it Kozowski? Possibly. He was there. And it was a murder. Uh, suspects were taken in, but never any convictions on that one. Now, there's an observation at this point. We can note that Kozowski and his wife moved from New York City to New Jersey just after this murder, or about the same time. And uh, since he moved to New Jersey, there's another body about to drop. Okay. Now, this one's uh, uh, a bit interesting, too. This is the oldest uh, murder victim in the, in the series. This is Elizabeth Sr., She's 73 years old. She's a housewife, uh, not a prostitute at all, just a, a regular victim, if you will. January 31st, 1892. Now, she lives with her husband in Millburn, New Jersey. Now, that's west of Jersey City. Now, he has a barber shop, at least he's working in a barber shop, in Jersey City. So they're west of Jersey City. Uh, husband Joseph works at night. So uh, when she was attacked, he wasn't there. It was a night attack, just like the Ripper murders, just like the Torso murders, as far as we can tell. He had discovered her body when he came home that morning. Now, she had deep gashes in her arms and hands and a stab wound in the throat. Now, by the blood evidence they found and the descriptions you can get in the newspapers, she put up a tremendous fight. This guy uh, would have had wounds on him. She was not going to go down easily. She had 11 stab wounds to the breast, and she laid on the floor. Now, this is after she had been stabbed in the throat. So like the Tabor, Martha Tabor murders, this is just anger. Again, no suspects were arrested, no one ever convicted. Now, what's interesting is that this is the third uh, uh, murder in America. At about this time, Kozowski's wife, she's now pregnant, Lucy, she leaves him and returns to London, and there's a good reason. He threatened to kill her. Oh, wow. Okay. So she's been there for the torso murders, at least uh, one of them. She's been there with him during at least two of the Ripper murders. Does she know what's going on? Can't tell. Now, there's a report in the London Daily Chronicle. It's dated March 23rd, 1903. This is during the, the poison trial in London. And it says, quote, The woman, they're talking about Lucy, the, the, uh, uh, the wife. The woman chanced to see a handle protruding from the underneath the pillow. She found to her horror that it was a sharp and formidable knife, which she promptly hit. Later, Kosowski deliberately told her that he, quote, meant to have cut off her head, 
and pointed to a place in the room where he meant to have buried her. She said, quote, but the neighbors would have asked where I'd gone, close quote. Oh, retorted Kozowski calmly, I would simply have told them you had gone back to New York. Now the point is on that, large braid, a large blade to cut off her head, kind of sounds familiar to me. Yes. <laughs> now there's another observation at this point. Kozowski had purchased a 32 caliber pistol, American pistol, in a wooden case. Now that pistol would be later discovered at his final business business in London in October of 1902. So now, the murders are occurring every four or five months. His wife's gone, she's gone back to London, and there's one final American murder. That was Herta Mary Anderson, she's 28. It's June 8th, 1892, just before he leaves for, for uh, um, London again. She's not a prostitute. The last two have not been prostitutes, as a matter of fact. She's basically a hotel worker near Rahway, New Jersey. Again, it's in New Jersey. The murders went across from New York to New Jersey as he moved. She's walking north home from Perth Amboy. She's done her shopping. Between 5.15 p.m. and 5.25, because we have people walking back in the Sioux area, they can tell you the, the uh, time frame. She's a mile from the hotel when she's attacked. Now, she's shot in the back with a 32 caliber pistol to the heart. Again, our man has just purchased a 32 caliber pistol. Throat cut from ear to ear. She was dragged 30 feet, 38 feet off the trail and dumped, murder only, no robbery. No packages were touched, nothing was open. Uh, she was soon discovered by others walking on the trail, and no one was ever convicted. Now, as an observation, it's kind of interesting because in October 1892, after the American murders, an American doctor named Arthur McDonald, who worked in Washington, D.C., requested to view the Ripper case files from the British Home Office. And the reason was he was looking for similarities in those four murders with the Ripper murders. Because even then, in 1892, a doctor, an official Washington, was beginning to link the events in, in Whitechapel with the events in America because they, they knew there were four murders. Uh, the British formally declined the request but gave no reason. Okay. So, was anybody ever arrested and convicted for any of these murders? Well, several men were arrested in these cases, but only one man was ever convicted, and his conviction was eventually overturned. And that was French Algerian Amir Ben Ali. He spent 11 years in prison for the Kerry Brown murder in 1891. And the only reason, <laughs> the only reason he was convicted of the murder, is that he was in that hotel down the down the hallway from room 31 where Kerry Brown was murdered. And what connected them to the murder, and they found out later it was false evidence was that there was a blood trail on the wall, on the ceiling, from area from room 31 to his room. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they finally discovered, a little late because they wanted to have this guy executed, Wow! but he wasn't, <laughs> good luck for him, but they discovered that the men who looked at the area, including the reporters, were so sloppy that they moved the, the, the blood, and they were the reason why it went to his room. I remember we talked about that earlier, and um, I... So, and I, I remember I brought this up to you um, off mic. Do you think that might have been a setup or maybe a fabricated story? Because you said it might have been somebody from the press. It might have been a, a so, police officer. Do you think somebody might have known that he was innocent and just trying to? Um... Well, uh, Detective Burns, the Captain Burns, the guy in charge of the case, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to get this guy convicted because he had bragged if, if Jack the Ripper comes to New York, we'll get him in 36 hours. Okay. And he bragged that he would never, he'd never be able to survive here in New York. And they had a Ripper style murder. Everybody knew it was a Ripper style murder, and he needed a body. Now that's a very good question. Was it intentional or accidental? You're never going to find that in a file. You're going to find the files that say, well, it was there, and, and uh, we think it was. We think it was a reporter. Could have been a setup. Did they know this guy was in the room down the hall? No, they would have talked to everybody in the hotel. Did he look uh, suspicious? Could we have a photograph of the hall before and after? Uh, don't know. Um, I can't s honestly say it wasn't. It might have been because uh, the authorities wanted to have this guy uh, execute a death penalty. He only got life. He ended uh, uh, 11 years in prison and eventually released. But uh, set up cannot be discounted. He could very well have been set up by the police or someone else, even a reporter. But I, I really don't think, uh, at least I hope no, no reporter would, you know, set somebody up for murder just for a, for a story. It's amazing how sometimes the press can, because um, this was, uh, Jack Ripper killings was a, was a big 
big press stuff. Then worldwide, 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 it sold a lot of papers. It did indeed. It sold a lot of. Uh, well, it did more than just sold a lot of papers. They were selling papers, three or four editions a day. So reporters, so reporters, um, who were in charge of the Jack Cooper story, probably with the celebrities at the time. Oh, absolutely. Like they were absolutely. Be, they were making a lot of money. Penny. They were penny uh, reporters. One uh, penny per line. And penny some of the line. penny yeah. per line. Some of these stories were were many, 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 many columns. So they were putting out quite a bit of material. I don't think the London papers have ever sold that many editions. And certainly uh, New York was following it very closely. And uh, there are reports from New York uh, all the way across to Los Angeles and, and Australia. So it's amazing that the, um, the resources of London were being drained to try to find this serial killer. But yet right. he was almost like becoming like a cottage industry for the uh, for the press. For the press at that time. Absolutely. Wow, it's yep. amazing how the world and works. And we've had people writing about it for the past 130 years. And still writing about it. Still writing about it. Oh, that, you know, I want, I want to say that before we move on. I, I think I might have actually saw a movie when I was younger called it Jack the Ripper in uh, the United States or something to that uh, accord. Like Jack the Ripper comes over to... Um, there, there have been a couple of, of, of uh, series that uh, would uh, emphasize the Rippers uh, coming to this country. Most of the time, if they're doing some kind of research, they'll say Carrie Brown. Okay. But that's as far as they're willing to go. But as far as Ripper murders in America, I took my hint uh, working on the, the, the four murders from Abilene. 